Today on Maker's Wharf, we'll learn how an MPU measures orientation. Hide Jeff Roberg's complex library behind a simple and easy to use interface. Fix Jeff's flawed conversion from quaternion to yaw, pitch, and roll. Learn how to save calibration results to persistent memory so that you don't have to calibrate every time you power on. Overhaul the current animation procedure. And finally, create a test procedure. How does one measure 3D orientation, meaning yaw, pitch, and roll? Well, for yaw, you could use a compass or magnometer. However, if you're also using, say, a brushless motor in your project, that'll create a magnetic field that'll interfere with the magnometer's measurement. You could use a GPS. Those measure course, which is similar, though not exactly the same as yaw. But those have their own problems. One of those problems is a low sampling rate, meaning you'll need something to fill in the 200 millisecond gaps between readouts from your GPS device. The MPU6050 does that. It also measures pitch and roll. The question is how? Well, the MPU6050 measures three linear accelerations called accelerometer readings and three angular accelerations called gyro readings. The question is how does it get from these acceleration measurements to a measurement of 3D orientation? Note first that the MPU6050 performs local measurements. Sure, it interacts with the outside world whenever it sends its results over to the microprocessor, and sure, it draws power from the outside battery. However, when it comes to the actual acceleration measurements themselves, those are done entirely within the confines of the small MPU6050 module. Why am I belaboring this local aspect of measurement? Well, because there's a very important principle in physics called the principle of equivalence that says that you cannot locally distinguish between the effects of gravity and acceleration. Meaning you cannot tell how much of your accelerometer reading is due to acceleration versus gravity. But to the extent that you can ignore acceleration, you can say that your accelerometer is measuring gravity. Meaning if we just renamed the accelerometer and called it gravitometer, we can say that acceleration of the gravitometer is the error in the gravitometer's measurement of gravity. The question then becomes, how does one get from a measurement of gravity to a measurement of 3D orientation? Here's how. You're standing inside a small windowless container here on Earth with a scale underneath your feet. Let's say someone on the outside pushes the container enough to tilt it. The container floor tilts, causing you to almost fall over, but you stick your arm out to support yourself against the container wall. By leaning on the container wall, you've now relieved pressure off the scale that lies underneath your feet. The more the elevator tilts, the lower the reading on the scale will be. In other words, you can use the reduction in the scale reading to infer the tilt angle. This must be how the MPU6050 measures 3D orientation. Mystery solved. Well, almost. This trick, and let's call it the gravitometer trick for future reference, has two problems. One is the acceleration error problem we spoke of just moments ago. The other is the fact that it only works for two of the angles we need for 3D orientation. It allows us to measure left-right tilt, which you can think of as roll, and it allows us to measure back-forth tilt, which you can think of as pitch, but it doesn't work for the yaw angle. If somebody rotated the container around its vertical axis, you would not see any changes in the readings in the scale underneath your feet. That's too bad. Is there some other trick we can use to get the yaw angle? One of the readings from the MPU6050 is, of course, rotational acceleration around the vertical axis, meaning the second derivative with respect to time of the yaw angle. Can we get from the second time derivative of something to the something? Well, we can apply an antiderivative, also known as an integral. So it looks like we may have another trick now. Let's call this one the uh, gyro integration trick for getting these orientations. If you remember from your calculus class, however, we can only get the final or current values using this trick if we have the initial values, including the initial value of the yaw angle, for example. So that's one limitation of this trick. Are there any other problems we should worry about using this gyro integration trick? Well, there's one more. If there's a bias error in the gyro's measurement, meaning let's say the gyro overestimates the angular acceleration by some constant amount, then if you look at what that does to the integral, 
you would see that it creates a term that gets magnified over time. In summary, the Skyro integration trick is only going to be accurate over small intervals of time. Now, by the way, this Skyro integration trick is performed for all three angles in an MPU, not just the R angle. So these two detectors, the gyro and accelerometer, have opposite problems, meaning the strength of one is the weakness of the other and vice versa. They're complementary. They go together like yin and yang, like peanut butter and jelly. You get the idea. It turns out in engineering, there are methods designed specifically for combining data from such detector pairs. Within the MPU 6050 module, the tempo, if you will, where this holy marriage occurs between the gyro and accelerometer is called the DMP. So when we go to install an Arduino library shortly, we need to make sure to find one that reads directly from the DMP. Otherwise, we're missing out on the whole point of using a detector like this one. Finally, I will say that the yaw angle sort of got left out of the marriage here. The gyro integration trick worked for all three angles, but the gravitometer trick, remember, only worked for two of the angles. It didn't work for the yaw angle. Not to fear, though, there are several potential suitors for marriage with the yaw angle. You remember our old friend, the GPS, it measures course, which is similar to yaw. So the same way the gyro and accelerometer were fused together inside the MPU, data from the MPU can then be fused with an external detector, such as the GPS or the magnetometer. The MPU6050 is cheap, tiny, and accurate. So if you know how to use one, it's a wonderful thing when it actually works. Unfortunately, when you go to buy one, it's a flip of the coin whether you get one that works. If you go on this website providing import-export data and type in MPU GY521, GY521, by the way, is the name of the breakout board for the MPU6050, you'll see that they all come from the same region. For some reason, bad modules are thoroughly mixed in upstream. So it's unavoidable. This is, of course, reflected in online reviews for all sellers. If you look at the reviews for the top seller on Amazon, the first review you see is titled, If you buy these, test them before you install them. The review clarifies that half the modules don't work. And most of the reviews for this seller and other sellers look the same. This is especially frustrating for new users, because you never know if you're running into trouble because the board itself is bad or because you did something silly. Now you might say, I'll just buy 10 of these and keep swapping them out to check to see if it's my fault or the manufacturer's. And if you scroll down to the review immediately below the one we just looked at, you see a reviewer trying exactly this approach. He's gone through seven modules already by the time he penned this review, and each of the seven modules had one fault or another. What makes this even worse is that if you look at his review, you'll see different faults occurring at different points in the setup. So he probably had to repeatedly swap out all seven modules at different points. So this approach might not save you time and frustration after all. But hold on, is it really unavoidable? Can't we just have someone who is not a new user, someone who knows enough about this board to say be making YouTube tutorials about it, buy a whole bunch of these, test them one by one to separate the good from the bad, and sell us only the good ones? Who, me? Okay, all right, I'll do it. Look in the description box below for a purchase link. Any component you buy using one of the links below will have been thoroughly tested by me before I ship them out. Now the wiring diagram. VCC goes to five volts. SCL on the MPU goes to SCL on your Arduino. And SDA on your MPU goes to SDA on your Arduino. To find out where SCL and SDA pins are on your Arduino, please consult the following table. The AD0 pin allows you to select the I2C address for this module. By setting it low, you're choosing hexadecimal 68. By setting it high, you're choosing hexadecimal 69. The library we're going to install will use hexadecimal 68 by default, but allows you to connect using hexadecimal 69 by commenting out one line of code and uncommenting another. Interrupt pin on MPU is connected to digital I.O. pin number 2 on Arduino. Now many Arduino users will use jumper wires and breadboards to make these connections. And this is a very easy and convenient way to prototype. But it has one huge drawback, and that's loose connections. In fact, loose connections are a heightened concern in our situation because we'll be moving the MPU around and rotating it into different orientations during testing. 
because that's what the MPU does. It measures orientation. There are alternatives that help to mitigate or eliminate the chances of a loose connection. If you're using a PCB like this one, for example, you eliminate the chance of a loose connection. The drawback there is that you have to design it, order it, and wait for the company to fabricate it. Luckily, I've designed and ordered PCBs that handle this connection and others and have them ready to ship to you if you wish to purchase from me. This board right here connects to the following components. An Arduino Mega 2560 Pro, an MPU6050, a micro SD card reader writer, an AU6M GPS device, and an on-off switch. You can purchase it with all these components included and each component will have been thoroughly tested personally by me before they're sent out to you. Please see purchase links in the description section below. Now I recommend that we look for and install the MPU6050 library using the Arduino IDE. So you fire it up and you go to Tools, Manage Libraries. Now we're going to search for MPU6050 and we get a bunch of choices. If you go through each of these choices, you can click on more info on the first one, for example, and then search within the GitHub for the keyword DMP, and you can choose in this repository. And you'll see this option doesn't make any mention of the DMP. So it has failed our litmus test for our library. If you perform this test for each of these libraries, you will find that they all fail except for the one by Electronic Cats right here. So if I hit on more info for this one and in the search bar again type DMP search in this repository, you'll see that, that it is in fact using the DMP. And so this one passes, we're going to choose this one. You click install and the library is now installed. Before getting started with coding, I want to briefly discuss development style and environment. On this channel, I will be using things like interfaces and dependency injection. Now, you don't often come across these practices in the Arduino community for a couple of reasons. One is the misconception that interfaces introduce a significant performance cost. This is simply not the case. And if you're really concerned about memory constraints, by the way, I highly recommend using an Arduino Mega Pro like this one. You can use this board to program large ambitious projects without any problems. The real reason you don't see these practices in the Arduino community, however, is that it's a hobbyist community. And hobbyists are typically newcomers. And these modern design practices are very unfriendly to the newcomer's intuition. We all start out with the intuition that the fewer intermediaries and classes in our code, the simpler and better our code will be you actually have to work hard to disabuse yourself of this intuition. We include these intermediaries called interfaces between different parts of our code because they allow for what's called loose coupling. Compare a flexible piece of wood in your mind to one that's completely rigid. Which one breaks more easily? And you don't have to wait until you're working on large ambitious projects to finally fix this intuition. I go over the logic for adopting these practices in excruciating detail in my video on dependency injection linked in the description box below. Finally, there's development environment. As you may know, there are many choices here. You can go with the good old Arduino IDE. It's free. It's very easy to set up and use. However, it doesn't offer much in the way of automation. Another very good choice is Visual Studio Code. The problem a lot of people have with Visual Studio Code is that they're unable to get IntelliSense to stop issuing these warnings. You know, those red squiggly lines. I have what I believe is the right solution to this, which you can check in my video on configuring Visual Studio Code for Arduino, linked in the top right corner and in the description section below. With the IntelliSense problem out of the way, Visual Studio Code is an excellent choice. However, my problem is that I'm very greedy and I want to get as much automation out of my IDE as possible. To this end, I'm keen on using Visual Studio Community 2019, not to be confused with Visual Studio Code. In order to do so, however, I have to use an extension called vMicro. Now, right off the bat, I want to say that I have no relationship with vMicro. I don't know who they are. They don't know who I am. 
we have not been in communication, they don't pay or, or sponsor me. And unlike all the tools we've discussed so far, vMicro is not free. Now with all this out of the way, let's finally get started with some coding. We're going to start by hiding this library's complexity behind a simple and easy to use interface. For a more in-depth look at interfaces and how to make full use of them, please check my video on dependency injection, linked in the top right corner and in the description section below. We'll fire up Visual Studio 2019, and we'll create a new Arduino library project as defined by the vMicro extension. We'll call it IMPU, the I indicating that it's an interface. We'll create this library in the Arduino library subfolder so that we can go ahead and use it right away. If you look at the impu.h file that vMicro has automatically generated for us, you'll see that we already have squiggly red lines from our IntelliSense. If I'm going to live with IntelliSense errors, I might as well be using Notepad for development. To get rid of them, you have to open the project as a regular Arduino project as opposed to an Arduino library project. So we have to close and get back in. Before closing though, note that this header file is already somewhat cluttered. For example, it's using the if and diff syntax, which takes up three lines of code to ensure that the header file is not included twice. In new versions of C++, we can achieve the same effect with one line of code, namely a pragma once command. And there are other examples of unnecessary clutter in this file. I am sure this was all done with intentions of backwards compatibility, but personally, I prefer to let go of the past so that I can move gloriously into the future. And since I have not committed yet to uploading this to GitHub, I'm really just writing this for myself and my viewers at this point. So I'm going to just delete this header file. I'll also delete the CPP file because interface classes should not have a corresponding CPP file. The reason we didn't start by directly creating a regular Arduino project, by the way, is that the library project option automatically generates for us the SRC subfolder as well as the library properties file, which helps. Anyways, now we're going to close out and start up again, this time creating a regular Arduino project. We'll place it in the example subfolder because an Arduino project is really just an Arduino sketch. And the first Arduino sketch might as well be an example sketch. To add an impu.h file, we right click on the project and choose add. Now we're going to avoid choosing any of the vMicro options at the bottom of the list because vMicro tends to overclutter our files with backwards compatibility that we're not interested in. So we're just going to choose class here. We'll name our class IMPU. The trick is to now click the three dots and very carefully choose to create these files in the SRC folder above our project folder. Now I don't have to browse to this location because I've chosen this folder in the past and Visual Studio remembers my choice. You on the other hand will need to browse to the SRC folder. Note also that there's some buggish behavior here by Visual Studio. Just because you see the path that you want doesn't mean that this is the path where the files will be created. If you click the X or cancel buttons, Visual Studio will create these files somewhere else. You have to make sure to click the save button after browsing to the desired path. You also need to remember to do this for both the header and CPP files. As you can see, the header file when created this way is far less cluttered than when using the vMicro automation. Note also that we don't need an include arduino.h statement in this file because this class is an interface. You're also able to confirm in the file properties window in the bottom right that the file was created in the desired location. Now an interface is simply a class that lists all the methods that our users will interact with. So naturally these will be public. We will start out with a very simple interface that has only two methods. An init method and a get yaw pitch raw method.
We will add more methods later when we need to create calibration functionality, but for now this is it. A quick look at the Electronic Cats library reveals that it is not compatible with the interface class we created. We're not going to modify the interface to ensure this compatibility because interface design has to be independent of implementation detail. If you're not sure why, please see my video on dependency injection linked in the description section below. On the other hand, we don't want to directly modify the Electronic Cats library folder because any changes there would be lost if and when we update that library. So if we cannot modify the interface and we cannot modify the library, then the only way to ensure compatibility is through an adapter that wraps around the library. Let's create this wrapper class now. We'll call it WMPU, the W indicating it's a wrapper class. Now the outside of the wrapper layer needs to match the inside of the interface layer. The outside of a class is simply its method signatures, meaning its method names, input and output types. The inside of a class is whatever you place inside its method definitions. The interface class is special in that it doesn't have an inside. Remember we deleted the automatically generated CPP file for the interface, where our method definitions would have been placed. The interface is nothing more than method signatures. So the outside of the wrapper class, meaning its method signatures, must match the interface method signatures. We achieve this by having the wrapper class inherit the interface class. When you inherit an interface class, you promise to implement its method signatures. Visual Studio helps you get started on fulfilling this promise with a nice automation. It even gives us a peek at the function definitions it's created for us in wmpu.cpp. Right now, they're empty function definitions. How should we populate them? Well, matching the wrapper layer with the library trivially means that inside method definitions of the wrapper class will call library methods, of course using library method signatures. There's plenty of calls to library methods in the DMP example sketch. So let's start populating method definitions of our wrapper class by copying and pasting content from the DMP sketch. The sketch starts with a bunch of include statements. Let's copy those into our wrapper class. Okay, where should we place them? WMPU.h or WMPU.cpp? Well, if you chose WMPU.h, then you've just fallen into one of this library's worst pitfalls. To avoid being flooded with compiler errors, we need to instead place them in WMPU.cpp. I believe this is related to the ill-advised placement of function definitions in one of this library's header files. To find out more about why one should not place function definitions in header files, please see my video on C++ header files. The setup function starts with some initializations. Let's copy these over to our init function definition. Emitting any serial commands. Along the way, if the compiler warns that we're missing declarations, we'll copy the necessary declarations. It then uses calibration results perhaps previously obtained for another MPU6050 module as a guess for a starting point for the current calibration procedure. We'll explain later why calibration results are referred to as offsets. It waits for the user to send any character indicating that the module is lying still and flat before the calibration commences. We're going to add calibration functionality to our wrapper class later. For now, however, we do want to give ourselves the option to at least use the guess offset values as our calibration. So we'll copy these set offset commands into a private guess offset method that we create on our wrapper class.
and we'll call it in our init method. Now we want to define our get yopage role function. We do this by grabbing the 3D orientations outputted by the DMP. The DMP outputs these in what's called quaternion format. So we'll need the conversion from this DMP's quaternion format to the more familiar format of yaw pitch and roll. Sounds easy enough, just the conversion from one format to another. Yet this is where many aspiring MPU6050 users run into problems. I think it's because you can more easily find conversions that are correct enough, meaning they'll give you the correct results at most angles with the exception of two angles, namely the north and south poles, where you get what's called gimbal lock issues. In fact, if you scroll up to the comments section at the top of this DMP sketch by Jeff Roberg, you'll see a warning about gimbal locks, meaning he uses one of these incorrect but correct enough conversions. I have the correct conversion, so we'll use mine instead of his. We'll borrow some of Jeff Roberg's code here that lets us read the quaternion from the DMP, but we'll take care of the rest ourselves. Here's the correct transformation from this DMP's quaternion as obtained by Jeff's library to yaw pitch and roll as defined by the Wikipedia page on aircraft principal axes. Finally, we want to use degrees instead of radians, so we have to remember to convert. We've put together quite a bit of code here. It'd be nice if we could run a test to see that it works. This is the purpose of our first example sketch, which we fittingly called runtest.ino. Now we'll want to only use the interface class in the sketch when interacting with our MPU. We don't want any mention of the wrapper class or any of the installed library classes here. Let's quickly remind ourselves of the reason why. Think of our sketches and our classes as parts of our code. These parts interact with each other and the number of interactions grows quadratically with the number of parts. So to keep development tractable as our code grows, we need to avoid having to rewrite the interaction terms, if you will, whenever a part is modified or swapped out. This is why we create interface classes. By A, making sure that the parts only interact through interfaces, and B, making sure that the interfaces are independent of implementation detail, we have much more robust software that is easier to maintain. We fulfilled condition B when we deleted the interface's CPP file. To fulfill condition A, we have to avoid mentioning the wrapper or installed library classes in our sketch. But we cannot simply declare an IMPU variable. C++ does not allow us to instantiate interface classes. We can only create IMPU pointers or references to other objects that are not interfaces. So the way to solve this problem is to write a function that returns an IMPU reference to an instance of the wrapper class. We'll call this function in our sketch, but we'll define it outside our sketch. Specifically, we'll define it as a method of a config class, which we'll call sample config. We'll need to then include the header file for this sample config class in our sketch. In a real world project, we'll have to create our own config class where we'll choose what specific class implementation gets returned for each interface. Think of our wrapper class as one choice of implementation of the MPU interface. We may have more if we're experimenting with different MPU libraries or different versions of the same MPU library. Our project's config class will likely have other methods returning implementation choices for other interfaces, for example, a GPS interface or an electronic speed controller interface, etc. Our sample config class just serves as a guide. Let's create it so that we get rid of these IntelliSense errors.
Let's add a comment reminding users to create their own config class. This sample config class is just a guide. In setup, let's begin serial. And let's initialize our MPU. In the loop section, let's call our get yaw method. And finally, let's print our results to serial. All right, let's run it to see if it works. Now we can run it using the vMicro extension in Visual Studio here, but let's just run it using the Arduino IDE for now. Great, it's running. So we see numbers printing out, that's a good sign. If I move it now, I see that the numbers are changing. So great, so the first test is a success. We've now confirmed that the simple and easy to use interface we built around the MPU library runs. It's still missing calibration functionality though. Let's create this functionality now. So what does it mean to calibrate a sensor? Well, ideally, we want our reading to equal the actual value being measured. So if we graph our reading as a function of the actual values, we want the graph to be a line that goes through the origin at a 45 degree angle with the horizontal axis. In other words, the blue line. Instead, in the real world, our raw readings as a function of actual values will look more like the red line. Let's define the origin as the actual value when the MPU is lying flat and still. By adding or subtracting a constant called an offset to the reading, we can make it match the actual value at the origin. This is called offset calibration. The other part we often have to worry about is correcting the slope of the raw readings as a function of actual values, meaning the slope of the red line. This is called gain calibration. It turns out in our case that we can get accurate results by only performing offset calibration and without having to worry about gain calibration. So when we say calibration going forward, we simply mean offset calibration. Now the graph shown is for a single sensor. Remember that our MPU6050 has six readings, three linear accelerations and three angular accelerations. So calibration will involve obtaining six offsets. There's an important feature we'd like to have in our calibration function not offered by the library we install. Rather than have to calibrate the MPU every time we power on Arduino, we want to perform the calibration only once and have the results of that one calibration saved to persistent memory and pull that result from that persistent memory every time we power on Arduino in the future. Does Arduino have memory that persists after turning off and back on? Yes, it's called EEPROM. Now it's likely that in any given project, we may need to store values in EEPROM from multiple classes or sensors. And we want to make sure that one class does not override values written by another. To mitigate this problem, we want all the decisions made regarding which value from which class or sensor is stored in which location in EEPROM we want all of those decisions to be made in one place in our code. This way, to check that there aren't any conflicts, we just have to visit this one place, as opposed to having to track down different parts of our code where these write operations are made. We'll call this one place where these decisions are made the EEPROM Manager class. Also, as you might have guessed, our WMPU class will interact with EEPROM Manager through an interface we'll call IEEPROM MPU. So let's start creating IEEPROM MPU.
It's an interface, so we won't need the CPP file. How will our MPU class interact with EEPROM Manager? By asking it to write and read calibration offsets to and from EEPROM. So the interface will list the following method signatures. We'd like to also be able to write and read a flag indicating whether valid calibration offsets have been saved, and to be able to reset this flag if for whatever reason we lose confidence in the offsets saved. The class that will implement IEE Prom MPU is of course the EE Prom Manager. So let's create that now. Remember this is where all decisions are made regarding where each value from each sensor including the MPU is stored. For the MPU we'll need to store offset values and a calibration flag. We'll use an enum to express where each offset will be stored on EEPROM. One important point to note here is that each location on EEPROM is one byte. An integer is two bytes, so if we're storing the offsets as integers, we need to make sure to space them out on EEPROM so that they don't overlap. This is why you see values in the enum skipping one as they go from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8 to 10 to 12. We'll use a constant integer for the location of our calibration flag on EEPROM and we'll call it calib flag address. If this flag stores an integer value of 77, it tells us that valid offsets are stored. A value of zero on the other hand indicates that no valid offsets are stored. We can save ourselves a lot of typing by using Visual Studio Automation to help us implement the methods of IE, PROM, and PU. Each of the methods we just added either writes or reads an integer value to or from EE, PROM. So let's create a couple of private helper functions to perform this basic task. To read the bytes themselves, we use the EEPROM library that comes along by default with the Arduino IDE. However, for me to convince Visual Studio to recognize this library, I have to take a couple of extra steps. I have to add this library's header file to my project and add the path to this library's folder to my C++ configuration. If you're not using Visual Studio, you don't have to worry about taking these two steps. Now we can use these helper methods to fill out the remaining method definitions. We'll use the enum and constant integers that we defined earlier for the offsets and calibration flag as input arguments for our helper functions. This takes care of EEPROM Manager and its interface. Let's now update IMPU and WMPU to reflect the fact that we're adding calibration functionality that includes this feature of being able to save offsets to EEPROM. We want WMPU to interact with the EEPROM Manager only through the IEEPROM MPU interface. We can achieve this by passing an instance of the manager class to the WMPU constructor. However, we'll pass it in as an IEE prom MPU reference. This way we'll avoid any mention of the manager class in WMPU. We'll then use this past reference to set the private member that we just declared here. Now there's only three things you can do with our MPU class. You're either using it, calibrating it, or resetting it. If you're resetting it, you just call the reset calib flag method invalidating any previously stored calibration results. If you're calibrating it, you simply make sure it's lying flat and still before calling its calibrate method. That's it, nothing else. If you're using it on the other hand, you have to make two calls, one to the init method, 
which runs some initializations and loads previously stored calibration results. And then you have to call the get yaw patrol method. Some initializations are common to both the calibrating and using scenarios, meaning they're performed both at the beginning of the calibrate method and in the init method. But we don't want to have to write these out twice, so we'll place them in a private method called begin. Note that we're using a member initializer list to set the private member EEPROM manager. For more information about initializer lists, please see my video on class constructors in C++. If anything goes wrong during the initializations in the begin method that we just mentioned earlier, then we want to halt execution. As we remarked earlier, the init method will load previously stored calibration results if they exist and are valid. What does it mean to load calibration results? Well, it's a two-step process. The first is to grab offsets from EEPROM using our EEPROM manager reference. The second is to set these as the active offsets, which is handled by methods from Jeff Roberg's library. We'll use calibrate methods from Jeff Roberg's library to perform the actual calibration. These automatically obtain the offsets and set them active. We then grab these offsets using methods from Jeff's library and store them in EEPROM using our EEPROM manager reference. As mentioned earlier, we plan on passing an instance of the EEPROM manager class to the WMPU constructor. So let's go now to our config class, where we currently call WMPU's constructor and modify it accordingly. It's time to start creating new example sketches that test our new functionality. Start with reset calib flag.ino. Before we create and run it though, let's add a serial command at the end of our reset calib flag method to let us know it completed the run. This new example sketch will look exactly like runtest.ino, only simpler. Let's save and run it to see what we get. A serial message telling us the reset is complete. Great. Now let's see what happens if we run runtest.ino. We get a serial message informing us that the MPU is not calibrated and that execution has been halted. Excellent. Next is the calibration example sketch. All we do is replace the reset calib flag method call by the calibrate method call and we have our calibrate.ino example sketch. Let's save and run. Great. And now that it's calibrated, when we run runtest.ino, it runs without a problem. Now that we've finished adding functionality to our MPU class, we want to test it to see that it's working correctly. There's two ways to do this. We can create a real-time animation of its outputted 3D rotations to see if they match with the reality. Think of this as the visual component of our test. And we can also directly check the numbers themselves which you can think of as the quantitative part of our test. 
It so happens that the DMP sketch that Jeff Roberg's library provides has an option for animation. It sends data over serial to another software called Processing.exe that then creates the animation using a library called Toxic Libs. I'm not sure the official download page is still alive for Toxic Libs. Regardless though, I really think that this entire animation process is in need of an overhaul at this point. Instead of sending data to Processing.exe and Toxic Libs, we're going to send it to vPython. Our runtest.ino sketch right now is already sending Yopich roll data over serial. The only modification we need to make to it is to add a 100 millisecond delay to the loop so that we're not jamming the data into Python. Let's create a Python project in Visual Studio that'll grab this data and create the animation. We launch Visual Studio and type Python in the search box. If you've installed the Python development workload in the past, you'll see a Python application option. If not, it'll come up empty with the option to install more tools. You can then check the Python development checkbox to install it. I have it installed already, so I'll back up at this point. We'll place our new Python application in the example sketch folder for runtest.ino. We'll start by typing in the command for importing the vPython library. Most likely in your case, you have not yet installed vPython, so you'll see red squiggly lines. Head over to the Solution Explorer and expand Python environments. Right-click the entry underneath it an open interactive window. In my case, if I scroll down, I'll see that I already have vPython. I also have another library we're going to need to connect over serial called PySerial, but you likely will have neither of these. To install them, you can just type vPython in the search box and you'll see the option to run command pip install vpython. Click that option. Once that's done installing, go back to the search box and type in pyserial and choose to run the command pip install pyserial. Let's finish up our import statements. We'll start by creating the stuff that's not affected by rotations. Things like the title, background color, dimensions, and so on. We'll do this in a function fittingly called setScene. Next, we want to display the numeric values of our three angles, yaw, pitch, and roll. This display will not rotate, but we'll need to update the values displayed in real time as the MPU is rotated. Next, we'll create the objects that actually rotate. This includes, of course, the MPU board itself. It also includes the labels on this board. We have the x-axis label, y-axis, and a label indicating which side is up. We want to also create those curved arrows we saw in Wikipedia's illustration of aircraft axes of rotation. These will help us check that the angles outputted by our MPU class increase and decrease in accordance with the convention set out by that illustration. Now the same procedure is used to construct each of these curved arrows. So rather than rewrite code, we'll place the procedure inside a helper function called rotation info. Finally, we'll combine all these objects together and return them as a compound object. Let's define that rotation info function we called just now. It'll take as input the ring's position vector, which also serves to define the axis of rotation. The arrow itself will be offset from the ring center, and this offset is also passed in as an input argument to this function. Finally, the function takes in the name of the angle, which will be either yaw, pitch, or roll. We'll then use these inputs to create the ring, which you can think of as the curved portion of the arrow. Then the arrow, which you can think of as the straight part. And finally, the angle name. Next, we'll use the PY serial library to create the serial object. I have my Arduino connected on COM9. You'll have to change this COM9 string literal to match whatever port your Arduino is connected on. We want to continually update our object's orientation, so we'll place the update code in a while true loop. Also, data might not be available at first, 
and we want to keep trying to update until it's there. So we'll wrap our update code in a try statement. We'll start by reading in the data from serial and parsing out the yaw pitch and roll values. We have to include a race statement here. This tells vPython the update grade. Now we'll use these freshly obtained yaw pitch and roll values to update the numeric values displayed in our figure. Next, we'll convert these freshly obtained angles from degrees to radians because Python likes radians. Now these freshly obtained yaw pitch and roll values only tell us the orientation relative to an initial orientation defined at zero yaw pitch and roll. We'll stipulate that at zero yaw pitch and roll, the x and y axes of the MPU point in the following directions. All we have to do now to obtain the fresh orientation is to apply the yaw pitch and roll rotations in sequence to this initial pair of vectors x and y. Let's start with the yaw rotation. We know what the starting directions are, we know the axis of rotation, and we know the angle and radians. In a situation like this, we can use what's called the Rodriguez formula to perform the yaw rotation on both the x and y vectors. We'll use this formula to define our Rodriguez rotation function, which again takes in an initial vector, an axis of rotation, and an angle and radians as inputs. Next is the pitch rotation. Note, however, that the x-axis is invariant under pitch rotation. So we only need to apply the Rodriguez pitch rotation to the y vector. Similarly, the y axis is invariant under roll rotation. So we'll only apply the Rodriguez roll to the x vector. We finally have the fresh orientation of x and y axes. However, to draw an object in vPython, you have to specify the y and up vectors, not the y and x. Luckily, it's very easy to get the up vector from the x and y vectors. The up vector is simply the cross product of the x and y vectors. Our Python code is now complete. Let's use it now for our test procedure. We're going to need a cuboid jig to help us align the MPU along cardinal orientations. First check that you have a level surface. Make sure that you're facing both the jig and the computer screen to facilitate comparison. Make sure that the jig is aligned against some fixed support or marking so that it can later be returned orthogonal to this initial orientation, and that this initial orientation matches figure one of the test form. Check that the serial port in animation.py matches the one Arduino is connected on. Now go ahead and upload runtest.ino to Arduino. Now run animation.py. We're now going to check our transformation to yaw pitch and roll. I recommend performing this check whenever the code is modified. Pick the jig up, move and rotate it, checking that these real rotations match what you see in the animation. Check also that each curved arrow in the animation matches the corresponding one in figure two of the test form. Check that numeric values displayed for the angles in animation increase and decrease in accordance with the curved arrows. Check that these numeric values have a range of minus 180 to 180 for yaw and roll and minus 90 to 90 for pitch. Finally, check for gimbal locks. Rotate the jig so that the y-axis is vertical and check that there are no spurious rotations or flips in the animation. Repeat for when the x-axis is vertical. Now let's perform our quantitative check. Here we're simply checking to see that virtual pitch and roll are close to plus or minus 90 degrees when the y and x axes are vertical respectively. Finally, line up the jig against the fixed support or marking, this time in the orientation orthogonal to the initial one as shown in figure four of the test form, and check that yaw reads close to minus 90.
Test complete. If you've made it to this point, congratulations. You are now an MPU6050 expert. If you wish to see more videos like this in the future, please support my channel using one of the links provided below. Till next time.